I could work over at the plant over that does the electronic stuff. Uh, I could work in agriculture. I could, you know, and so on and so on and so on. There was like, had to be 25 different jobs. So this is great, right? Because everybody's been told that they, they should leave, right? Go get, in a, go get a four-year degree and leave. So I said, now let's think about some of these jobs. Now, how many of these jobs and what type of job would require just a high school diploma? So there was a few, right? I said, that's good, okay. So in some cases, that's all you're going to need, right? If that's what you want to do, that's great. So how many of these jobs would require an associate's degree? Fair few, okay, all right, that's great. And I said, how many of these jobs would require a four-year degree? And again, you know, it wasn't quite a third, a third, a third, but, you know, give or take one or two here and there. That's the way it broke down. So I said, well, you know, if you want to stay, and, you know, staying doesn't mean you don't succeed. Staying is not the same as failing, because you could get one of those jobs with a high school diploma, with an associate's degree, with a certification. And so, you know, I was so pleased with myself. <laughs> I was like, and that hubris, of course, you know, you should never be too pleased with yourself. Because one, I had survived the assembly. Um, but two, you know, I said, really, you know, so I said, you've, you've got two messages here. The first message is you do not have to leave to succeed. And two, you have options after high school with respect to education. Great. I was, I was, for all, all the talks I did that day, I did four that day and one the next morning. I was like, this is great. These kids really got it. So I'm back to the school the next day for a debrief after the fifth talk. Barely able to speak because my voice is shot. And one of my um, chaperones from the school, Mr. Coriel, who does various technology courses with the kids and whatever else, very beloved teacher. He says, oh, i got a funny story for you. So I said, what was the story? He said, well, there are twins in 11th grade who came barreling up this morning as soon as they got off the bus. Mr. Coriel, Mr. Coriel. Yeah, what is it? We went home yesterday and we told our mother that there was a guy down at the school who said, you don't have to go to college to be a success. Okay, warped message, <laughs> not received correctly, my fault. There's a, you know, I felt, okay, maybe I shouldn't feel so big about myself, right? And then she said, she replied to them, don't be silly. And she probably said, don't be stupid, but I'm doing the family version. Don't be silly. Um, there's no way the school would have somebody come in there and tell you that. That's just nonsensical. Just, just get on the get. Just do get your homework. What? Just out of my sight. We tried. <laughs> so he, here are two things within that. One, I'm obviously a really bad communicator to kids in a school, and you really shouldn't put me in front of an assembly. But more importantly, forget about me, is the fact that the mom has an image of what college should be and what college should do. And it doesn't matter, I can give her the best information about who fails, who drops out, who has debt, and so on. It's not going to be erased. Certainly not at the stage of 11th grade. So what can we do? Right, so I'm still on the what we can do. Well, what we can do there is uh, what some of the, the superintendents in rural Pennsylvania have been doing. And what they do is they start in 7th and 8th grade uh, and they take every kid to the local Votech. It's a state-of-the-art, recently renovated Votech and they take them around and they show them all the things that you can do there and they tell them about the jobs you can get with these qualifications and what they pay. And it's a real head-turner for the kids. It's like, you can do what? What? You, how much? Okay, so, right, the, the seed. But who is the single most important person in any decision they're going to take? Educators. Their parents. Right? 
their parents are the single biggest thing. So he was, again, sort of like thinking, okay, well, this is working with the kids. But the parents are still going to look at the Votech as the runner-up prize. They're going to see that as somehow not being good enough to get where you should be in a four-year degree program, right? And so he now has started bringing the parents. As many as can, be, you know, can come along to these tours, he brings them around and shows them the Votech. And their heads are turned because, quote, oh, I never knew it was this nice inside. <laughs> oh, I never knew they did this program here. They earn how much? <laughs> you know, so one of the things we have to do is we, we have to level the playing field in terms of the resources. We have to begin to plan very early, for sure in middle school, before kids take decisions in high school that will impact the trajectory they're going to take. If you don't take that math that can help you read a blueprint, you won't be able to do that job. So you'll be staying and you'll still be underskilled. And we have to get the parents involved. We have to show them what the options are. And again, it's not, it's not about tracking kids. But we have to be smart in the information that we provide. We don't provide enough. Which is why 41% of kids of, um, whose parents didn't go to college graduate, for, uh, whereas 63% of kids whose parents did go to college graduate. Uh, I'll give you a, a, just a quick, for instance, of that we're doing a new project on the generation kind of coming of age in the recession. So we have this guy who started his college selection process in 12th grade. And the process was very quick. He went to a college fair, picked up a bunch of brochures, picked a college that would take him with his grades, applied, got in because, hey, they're private. They like to. And they arranged for him to take out the loans that he needed. He didn't ask for any kind of tuition reduction. He didn't ask for any kind of scholarship money. His parents are both working class people. His father worked removing asbestos in a plant near Philadelphia. And so he graduates in sports management, something like that, it's one of these majors, after four years, uh, with $102,000 worth of debt, all of it private. So it's debt that's at, if you're lucky, it's in the 20s percentage-wise, but probably not, it's probably north of 30%. Move back home with mom and dad, works two jobs. Pizza delivery is his big job. He works in Coles part-time as well. And is dreading the day when that first letter comes through the door that his payments are starting to become due because he simply doesn't make enough money to even make a payment per month. Now, we can look at he is an outlier, sure. The average college debt now just went over 25000 There was a report yesterday. But this is what's happening to some of our kids. Now, he's lucky because he has a degree. There are kids with commensurate amounts of debt who don't. And we see him sitting outside Wall Street, outside City Hall in Philadelphia, in Oakland, wherever else around the country. And they have these, their little signs about you know, how much debt they have. So, you know, we've really been guilty of not informing our children enough. And I think that's a collective guilt. We're doing a poor job. If we, it's great if people can go to a four-year college and thrive and whatever and get through it and don't have a lot of debt. But you know, there are so many who, who do, are not that way. 
and for whom it's going to be very, very difficult. Okay. Last set of things, and I'll open it up for discussion. I've gone on a long time, and I'm really sorry. I'd like to hear what you have to say. So, you know, going forward, I think first steps that you have to take are building coalitions. Uh, building coalitions, thinking regionally, um, having people, you know, as I said, the business community is key in this. Educators are certainly key. They're the sort of central institution that can do a lot of good. And it, I know it adds more work to what you do as educators at a time when you've been cut right, left, and center by municipalities and states. I understand that. But that you guys are so important that if you're not at the table, this isn't happening. Um, you need to invite other stakeholders that have an interest in this. Um, so uh, beyond the business community, other civic organizations. The more you have involved, the better chance you have of leveraging resources from different ways. Things that you might not know are there, but they know, and so on. Things that you know are there that they don't know. And so, you know, so you, it's a great way to sort of build that. And thinking regionally, I could give another bunch of examples, and if you want to ask about this in Q&A, um, of dramatic turnarounds of towns that have been on their knees just by having, as one person called, uh, described it to me, a collective epiphany, right? That you say, we have to work together to, to maximize our chances of succeeding, to maximize our chances of building resources and so on. Um, I'm happy again to talk about things that are working elsewhere. If you've just bought the book or picked up the book outside, the, the afterword that we appended to the book this year has several examples, four, I think, of things that are working elsewhere. So um, I'm happy to talk about them in Q&A. What I want to leave you with, though, is, um, and I'm not going <laughs> to give you a message like I did to the kids, because I'm afraid to do that now. <laughs> in case it get, I'm not disrespecting you in any ways, but in case it gets mangled. But uh, what I do want to sort of finish up on is, is this. Um, when we wrote the book, I wasn't sure that this was an issue that really could be tackled in any substantive and successful way. I am now positive that it can be because I've seen it. And you know, my message is for places that have this as an issue, don't give up because there's a lot you can do. And remember, you bring a lot to the table when you become a part of this. So thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer some questions area here where we have a fair, uh, a fair amount of uh, Latino immigrants, and uh, how can we use that to our advantage here? I, I think it's, it, it's, um, it's one of the ways you can save small towns, but only if it's done right. So let me, that, that's the quick message. Let me fill that out a little bit for you. We just finished a piece for the annals on this, you know, can immigration save small town America? Um, and I, and I think it can, because there are enough examples. And, and in the piece that we wrote, we contrasted two places, Hazleton, Pennsylvania, which many of you might have heard of. There was a um, big sort of standoff between the local politicians and, and citizens and Latinos uh, in Hazleton in, in the mid-2000s. And St. James, Minnesota, which has you know, historically had a sizable Latino population has gotten bigger over the last 20 years. Uh, and they made a real strong, conscious effort to, to integrate Latinos into every sort of part of their civic life. So in, po in terms of politics, in terms of education, uh, the churches have worked very hard. Uh, all the different churches have worked very hard on, uh, again, this kind of pro-integration stance. And, and they realized, I mean, the people I, interviewed in St. James's for the piece, now realized that, look, 